Did you know that uh, I was Tuesday morning, I don't know what was going on, but Tuesday morning I was just uh, early. I, I don't know about you, but God visits me kind of early in the morning. And I just love those seasons. It's kind of the sun's not up yet, and it's just it just seems to be a time of revelation. But Tuesday morning, man, I was got caught up, and I I started to see just the future, what God's doing with us, in us, and through us as a place. And wow, there's I was just so there, so stuck. The dog started to move around. I said, "Chill, Coco. We're in the presence of God here." And, <laughs> and I just wanted to stay there so much, you know. And then I was kind of just kind of chilling a bit and then I thought what is today something what's about today I don't know God God visited really really strong today and I I looked up May 2nd I said what's today and it didn't seem to be much going on I said but what's happening Sunday I mean who what's and I said May 7th I checked out May 7th and May 7th uh, is uh, world laughter day <laughs> true story I thought wow that's pretty cool I, di I didn't know that how many knew that it's been World Laughter Day actually for quite a few years. So, with the nice weather and things, people are getting out doing stuff that you didn't do or couldn't do in the winter months. And a fella decided to go skydiving, and he didn't want to, you know, do a tandem jump with somebody. He wanted to experience the whole thing himself. So he trained for a while with them. They showed him what to do, and he he was there his time. He jumped out of the plane, and he's falling, going, "This is fantastic! This is so great!" And then he pulled the cord like they said, and nothing happened. And just boom, he's just falling. He's going, "Oh my goodness!" He's like checking everything. Is the emergency thing? He's checking things out. He's getting a little frantic, and all of a sudden, as he's falling, a guy is coming up, going past him. And he said, man, do you know anything about, about these, these here parachutes? He says, no. Do you know anything about gas barbecue? <laughs> Anyways, it's, uh, it's World Laughter Day. How many woke up early to watch the coronation of King Charles? How many? Surely you did. I know you did. Oh, come on. Anybody? You, you, don't, be, don't be afraid. No, don't be shy. You know, I, I grew up, uh, my, my dad was Welsh. My, my mom was, was British. My dad born in, in Pontypridd, Wales. My, my mom was a Yorkshire girl, born in Yorkshire. And uh, So, Phil, you were up early watching the whole thing? No, Phil, come on. You part of the uh, wrong wrong side of the Irish. The other side. <laughs> Never mind. My goodness, it could be fisticuffs before we end here. Settle down. <laughs> Settle down. But you know, I, I got up. Uh, I didn't get up real early, but I got up in time to see some of it. And beautiful. I mean, it's just amazing. The, the Brits really know how to do that whole pomp and circumstance, don't they? But uh, I got a picture here of their King Charles, and I just, you know, I saw. I loved. You know, remember when the Queen? The Queen did the light bulb thing. You know, she. She turned the light bulb, and I love the turn the light bulb one, you know. Charles just had the, hey. Uh, but how many feel really different? Because, you know, he's our king. We're part of the Commonwealth. He's, he's the king of Canada. Charles III is the king of Canada. How many, how many feel different? How many know that you're under a new ruler? This guy can bring some new ideas, new concepts. Today, you know, that whole aspect of, of king and kingdom in Britain is a whole lot different. I mean, it's more ceremonial than it is a, a really a, a dictatorship or, or, or a kingdom or a or monarchy. But that was the king there. So here's a picture of the coronation from the back. Look at that. There was hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. Even though this is just more a, a type and more, you know, a ceremonial than it is really governmental. I mean, these people are seriously into... The the king, you know what I mean? An interesting family, I'll tell you that. But uh, wow, I just looked at the crowds, looked at the crowds that were showing up to see the coronation of King Charles. I have to say, I was smiling, I was enjoying it. I thought it was pretty good. Saw some Canadian flags in the crowd, lots of Canadians there. So here's another picture. I got this one. Uh, this is uh, an actual picture of when Jesus was born, and uh, I found it <laughs> myself. But you know, that, that's when, when the king of glory came. That's when the king of kings was sent. That's when uh, 
it says, it says that the angel said, for unto you is born this day a Savior. He is Christ the Lord. He is Curios. He is Lord. He is the King of glory. And unto us is born this day a Savior. And he's come. Glad tidings, good news, peace on earth, and goodwill to all men. And there it is. Wasn't much of a crowd. Not too many people showed up. A cow and a donkey. And I understand a few shepherds showed up later. And some kings showed up. Probably a couple years later, some kings showed up because they said there's a new king born. And he really is. There's a new king born. And he is King Jesus. Psalm chapter 2, 6 to 8 says, Yet I have set my king. This is the prophetic word, the Father saying, I have set my king. The Father has set his king. Jesus is king. Jesus always was king. Jesus will always be the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is absolutely Lord, supreme Lord. There is no other. None can compare. Jesus is the king of kings and the Lord of glory in every way. He is absolutely in charge of every single thing. His voice, his word sustains everything. Everything is held in place by the living word of the king of glory. Jesus Christ is Lord of all, king of all, king of kings, glorious king. Hallelujah. See, we are in a kingdom. We are not in some democracy or a republic. We are a part of a kingdom. And we want to talk to you for weeks about the kingdom. I have set my king on my holy hill. I love Psalm 2. God, he sits in the heavens and he laughs. See, when there's things going on in the world, how does God feel about that? Ha, ha, ha. It's World Laughter Day. You should laugh. Ha, ha, ha. God sits in the heavens and he laughs. And his enemies are in derision. See, there's nothing that can withstand the plans and purposes of the king of glory he's going to have his way he's going to manifest his desire his outcome his desire with well, the result he demands it will come forth and nothing can hinder it it doesn't matter what's going on in the world today. You know, Psalm chapter 2 was quoted when, when they were taken, and, and Peter and John, when they were taken, and they, they used the name of Jesus, and people were set free and healed. They used the name of the king. They said, in the name of the king, in the name of the new king, I command you, if guy on his bed, you know, he was there crippled from birth, and he said, I don't have anything else. I got nothing else to give you, but I come in the name of the king. I come in the name of the one who has all power and all authority, and in the the name of the King Jesus I command you to be made whole pick up your bed and walk and that guy boom the lame man was made well well they got thrown in jail you know why I got thrown in jail they got thrown in jail for using the name and you know what they said don't use the name anymore because they understood and everybody who watched understood that when these people use the name the king and his kingdom comes into expression when they say the name of Jesus the full expression that a kingdom comes into manifestation where they are where they are they bring the will and purpose heaven invades earth everywhere they are because they exercise the name of Jesus and see, they quoted that. They said, why do the nations rage and people plot in vain against the purpose of God? You took us, you whipped us, and you beat us, but it's all vain. It doesn't matter because nothing can withstand the forceful advance of his kingdom. And I love what he says. He says, now ask of me, and I will give you the nations. I will give you the nations for your inheritance. Jesus sent us out with power and authority. He didn't send you out with power and authority to win the lost. He says, I send you with power and authority to disciple the nations. We are not here just to win a few souls, although that's how we do it. We bring people one at a time. We bring people into the kingdom of God. We disciple the nations. We bring them under the manifestation of God's kingdom by bringing them. They're born into the kingdom of heaven. But you see, he says, ask of me and I will give you the nations as your possession. You see, we are not born into the kingdom of God to be servants. We are born into the kingdom to be sons and daughters. We are born into the kingdom to be priests and kings 
praise of the Most High God. We've been brought into the kingdom so that we are restored to rule and have dominion over the affairs of earth. He said, ask of me and I'll give you an inheritance. I don't have a job to do. I don't have a responsibility to fulfill. I have an inheritance to lay hold of because I am a son of God. He is the king of kings and I have inherited a responsibility to manifest my sonship and exercise his reign and rule everywhere I go. That's why we're kingdom people. The church is not the purpose of God. The church is God's purpose for revealing the kingdom. So we are here. Ask of me and I will give you the nations as your inheritance. Give me Iran. Give me China. Give me Russia. They're not my problem. They're my opportunity. And the Lord is moving and his kingdom is invading every circumstance. Adam lost his rule. Jesus came and brought the kingdom. Jesus came and brought us to where we had never been. Brought us to where we could have never gone on our own. Jesus brought us into sonship. We haven't been taken back to the responsibility of Adam to, to guard, to keep and protect. But we are now sons of God by God himself. We have been born into the kingdom of God. God is not my God. He is my father. Father. He's my father and I have a responsibility. Jesus restored the kingdom of God. But we're here in this period where there's a mixture of the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of God. But it's our responsibility. You are the light of the world. Wherever there is darkness, we are not a light. We are the light. And we are commanded to turn the lights on everywhere we go. Buy some haagen for somebody in line. Pay attention to the people around you. Reveal the goodness, the love, and the kindness of God everywhere where you go. You are a king. You're radiant. Those people are still ever going to talk about. Remember that guy who bought us a haagen -Dazs? And on that experience is a revelation of the kingdom. And on that experience is a spirit of prophecy and a demonstration of Jesus Christ. Where you express and manifest the kingdom, the kingdom comes and all the force of the kingdom is manifest. The kingdom of God is eternal, but dominion is generational. The kingdom of God God is eternal, always was, always was, forever will be, but dominion is generational. If God's going to have dominion in 2023 on this world day of laughter, if God is going to have dominion today, it means that you and I have to exercise that dominion now. For God to have dominion, it has to happen through a man, a man who's been born anew, a man born into the family who understands who his father is and understands that he now has a responsibility responsibility to exercise dominion. Acts 13, 36, now when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. God has placed you in his eternal heart and mind and purpose. Today, God has placed you in 2023 because today, God has something for you to do to bring about and to manifest his dominion and his kingdom. Yeah. Hallelujah want to make this really clear psalm 115 16 the heaven of the heavens are the lord's even the heaven they're the lord's but the earth he has given to the children of men why did jesus have to be a man jesus had to be a man or he could not have redeemed us a man lost it a man had to get it back Jesus came as a man so that he could return with authority to humanity so that he could then, what he won, he could give us. He got all authority and power back so that he could give it back to us. And it's been done through him. It's not been done through us. We didn't do it. He did it. And now he gifted it to us. He didn't tell us now earn it, now try to qualify for it. He absolutely, totally dominated every bit of darkness, sin, death, the devil. He crushed and defeated it. Now we have a responsibility as the sons of God to enforce his victory everywhere we go. So in every single sphere in every realm in this generation, will you manifest dominion today? Because if God's going to have dominion in this sphere, it's going to be through people who come into a revelation of the headship of Christ, the kingdom of God, and understand their inheritance that if the nations will be taken, it's because we ask for them and we possess them.
So we have a responsibility to bring the kingdom of God into expression. Mark 1.15 says, the time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near, which means it's here. Repent, align everything you have. Change your mind about everything. Align yourself right now with the good news. Think again about it all. One of the greatest differences between the old covenant and the new covenant is the location of God. God was in Christ. The incarnation, God became man. God became man. God moved out of that heavenly sphere and he took on flesh. Hallelujah. And because he did that, he took on humanity. And when he moved into Jesus and Jesus fulfilled his death, his life, his death and his burial and ascension, Jesus then was given authority to put his spirit now in every one of us. So now the location of God is the body of Christ, a body I have prepared for myself. For the spirit of God to move on the earth, he needs a body. A spirit cannot function without a body. It's a natural principle. If you don't have an earth suit you leave when your earth suit quits your spirit goes god the spirit of god his partnership with us cannot happen unless he has an earth suit and he didn't just provide one or two earth suits he said a body i have provided for myself and in acts chapter 2 we see the spirit of god birth the church the corporate manifestation of the body of christ to fulfill his dominion in the earth Amen, Pastor. So think again. Think again. God is in you. Got a picture here. Pastor Tim talked about his daughter, Cheryl. And this is Cheryl's hand. It really is. I, I told her to send me a picture of your hand because he talked about it, but I wanted you to see it. And I remember when Cheryl got that tattoo. She was really impacted by the fact that she was a living, walking, mobile tabernacle of the presence of God. Everywhere my feet go, the kingdom comes. And she wanted to put that on her right hand. And she she wanted people to know that when she comes, the kingdom comes. And when people go, what's that? What's that all about? What's that kingdom tattooed on your forearm? It says, because the kingdom is at hand. Lay your hands on the sick and they shall recover. She said, where I come and where I am, my hand is a doorway. My hand is an access point. My hand is the power of God. My hand looses the kingdom wherever I go. And so that gives you an opportunity to pray for people. Do you need a manifestation of the kingdom today? Because I serve the king of kings. I am a king myself. He has endued me with all power and all authority. And I am here now to abolish everything that is not of the kingdom. Is there some darkness creeping in your world is there brokenness creeping in your world i right now can dispense on you heavenly favor and that's what it means the kingdom's at hand do you know what you're packing do you know how powerful you are do you know what is invested in you do you know that the power that raised christ jesus from the dead bodily dwells in you it's all right there there's not a situation that you walk into that you can't operate and how do you do it pastor how do you do it in the name of jesus See, they never, ever prayed that way in the Old Covenant. Never, never once. And Jesus said in the upper room, I'm going to give you a new way to pray. From now on, you don't pray like that. From now on, you pray in the name of Jesus. And whatsoever you ask in my name, it will be given to you. Hey, hey. Don't use it in vain. Don't, don't use it without an expectation. Don't throw it around and go, well, you know, if it be your will, in Jesus' name. Don't put rubbish, attach rubbish to the name of Jesus. His name is exalted. It's an exalted name. It's not just a name that he was given. It's a title that he realized because of the finished work of the cross. He ascended to the right hand of the Father. He sat down, I'm done. And then boom, you are now a carrier. See, the devil had a nervous breakdown because God became a man. He didn't understand. He went, man, let's get rid of him. Problem was, he got rid of him. He didn't realize that he played right into the eternal purpose of God. Because through the death, burial, and resurrection of God, now, once and for all, you have become qualified to become living walking containers of the power of God now he's having a nervous breakdown because we when you guys walk out this place he devil loves when you guys pack in here and you do your own little happy time he loves it they're oh good they're all locked down but when I let you go and give you the benediction and say go wrapped in the Holy Ghost the devil hands out Valium to all the demons <laughs> Look out, impact just opened up. They're back, they're back, they're back. 
The kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus is not the gospel. Jesus is not the gospel. Jesus preached the gospel. He's the means to the gospel. Jesus said, I am a door. I am an access point. Jesus, the good news of the gospel is that Jesus brought the kingdom of God to earth. Jesus said the good news, here's the good news, the kingdom of God is now here. The reign and rule of my heavenly father, the exercise of his purpose in every sphere of life, I have brought that to earth and it's now yours. It's not that you get to go to heaven, although you will. The thing is, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we're here to bring that about Jesus. God bless, we love Jesus. We lift Jesus, exalt Jesus. But you know, isn't Jesus amazing? But imagine if that girl just walked in, Wayne, you're wonderful, Wayne, you're wonderful, but she never ate the haagen ice cream and it just melted on the floor. <laughs> Jesus came to bring something. Jesus came to bring something. Jesus came to exalt you. Jesus came to bring about a purpose. Jesus came to declare and preach a kingdom. He came to bring a complete, absolute shift to the whole world. Jesus came to bring heaven to earth and said everything in our world could be transformed by his holy presence. Jesus is the simple doorway. He is the access point. Jesus, the King of Kings, gives us access to this new kingdom. Acts 1, 2 to 3. And through the Holy Spirit, he's given us commandments, and he gave commandments to the apostles during 40 days, speaking of them things concerning the kingdom. Acts 28, 30 and 31. Then Paul dwelt two years in a rented house. All who received him, he preached the kingdom, teaching them things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, and with all confidence, no one forbidding him. The book of Acts starts with Jesus, 40 days before the ascension preaching the kingdom you'd think somebody's last words last sermons before they leave earth this is this is my last time this is this is the last time i'll be able to communicate layers of truth to you you would think his last communications to you would be very very important and the important message of the ascent of the resurrected christ before the ascension was i want you to understand the kingdom Paul, his ministry in the end of Acts, they taught about the kingdom. Every kingdom has a ruler, a realm, and rules. A kingdom is the governing influence of a king over his territory, impacting it with his will, his purpose, and his intent, producing a citizenry of people who reflect the culture and manifest the nature of the glory of God. We are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. I am a citizen. I have a passport in Canada, but more important, I am a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. I have every right, every privilege, every power of the kingdom realm. Stephen talked about the ruler Jesus. Thank you, Stephen. Talked about the king, a king. He is an empowering king, a serving king, a loving king, an uplifting king, but most importantly, he is a king maker. He's not just a king. See, we have kings who won't share their authority. We have kings that are absolute, and they can say, off with your head, and boom, it would be done. Back in the good old days of Henry VIII and some of those guys, I mean, whatever they said, it was law. I said it, let it be done. Thank God it's not like that anymore. But you see, we have a king who has absolute authority. What he says, God's word, when God speaks a word, the word itself is empowered to accomplish that for which he sent it. But see, our king is a loving king. He's a serving king. He's a self-giving king. But he's not just that. Our king is a king maker. He wants to share his glory with you. He wants you to be enthroned with him. He's given you joint seating in his throne. Come sit up here. Come and sit with me and let us exercise a authority. He shared his power. He shared his authority and he wants to partner with you to see his purpose realized in the earth. Amen. Amen. It's not a religious call to serve with self-abasing religious activity. Let's go do some self-abasing religious stuff for the king. That's not how this kingdom works. Let's go demonstrate the kingdom in a broken world. Let's use the name of Jesus and watch heaven invade every evil situation. So we are not, we are here and he came, but to let his reign, his self-giving love influence every sphere of our lives. Revelation 1, 5 and 6, to him who loved us and washed us from his sin with his own blood and made us to be kings and priests, to him, to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever, amen. See that, see he is a king maker. We are a priest, we are a pontiff, we are a bridge, we bridge to all 
all brokenness. But over that bridge, we push the cargo of heaven. We are priests. We are, we are connections to the heavenly realm. But we are also kings that we can invest, we can manifest, we can release the power of the kingdom everywhere we go. How did that happen? He didn't offer it to you. He made you a king and a priest. He's a king maker. Our king, it's a whole different kingdom. It's a kingdom of shared love and exercise. It's not a kingdom of self-abasement. It's a kingdom of exaltation. He will exalt you. He will lift you up. He will hold you in his hand like a royal diadem and say, look at how wonderful I am. Look at what I've done for my creation. He loves us so deeply. Jesus is a king maker. Psalm 8, 4 to 6. What is man that you're mindful of him, the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels. One of the worst translations in the Bible. One of the worst translations in the Bible. It's the word Elohim. Everywhere else, hundreds of times, Elohim is used as the name of God. But for some reason, the translators decided it can't be he made us a little lower than God. That's a little too much. He made us a little lower than the angels. Because they didn't, the translators themselves didn't get a revelation and an understanding that he is a king maker. He's not looking for self abasement. He's not looking for people to rule over. He's looking for a family to share his authority with. He's looking for sons and daughters that can pursue an inheritance that he's qualified you to possess you didn't qualify yourself he qualified you Elohim a little lower than Elohim and he crowned him with glory and honor who man he crowned us with glory and honor you have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands you have put all things under his feet church if we don't like what's happening in the world don't embrace a world system don't embrace a vehicle that the world has created to try to bring a spiritual truth if we want to bring spiritual transformation you need to take your place as a king of glory don't diminish yourself to participation in a system that has fallen you're way bigger than that you're way more than that you have way more power than that now get involved in everything you can get involved in but when you're there don't believe that this little structure that you attach yourself to will change a thing attach the kingdom where you go and watch the kingdom of God bring transformation Jesus, God highly values man and his creation. The realm, the realm is engaging the king. Where is the realm? It's not a place. It's not here. It's not there. The realm is where he's engaged. You know, you feel the power of God and presence of God when you come here because we've engaged the king. We've engaged the realm. We've engaged his promises. We're praying. We're prophesying. We're singing the word of God and we're engaging his purpose. See, you can be in the kingdom of God and not engage it. You can be surrounded by the Spirit of God and not tap into it. You can be positionally a king and never experience the practice of his headship and kingship in your life. We've got to engage that. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. What it should say is the Lord is the Spirit. The Passion Translation says, now the Lord I'm referring to is the Holy Spirit. Wherever he is Lord, it's not where the Lord is, it's wherever the Lord is Lord. The Spirit of God is here right now. But it's when we acknowledge his lordship. It's when we allow the spirit of God to be supreme. When we allow his lordship to be exercised and manifest, that's where the kingdom is. The kingdom of God. I mean, man, the kingdom of God is massive and powerful. But for the kingdom to be released, we have to submit ourselves. We have to come into those who are led by the spirit of God. They are the sons of God. When you're led by the spirit and you walk by the spirit, you're loosing kingdom because you've submitted yourself under the lordship of the spirit himself where the spirit of the lord is lord there is freedom emancipation from every form of bondage because his lordship has been engaged recognized and received see pastor you're trying really hard hallelujah the kingdom of heaven is like yeast i shared this a few weeks ago it says a woman put it in the 60 pounds it says quietly progressively and inevitably 
it increases. Now quickly, quickly, say quickly, Pastor. All right, the rules. You ready for the rules? How many love the rules? Give me those rules to obey. I love rules. I can check those boxes. Hallelujah. I'm a box checker. I wanted to know, finally, what are the rules around here at Impact Church? Tell me what the rules are. A new commandment, a new rule I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you. There it is. Say as. Say as. Scary word right there. Because don't love like you can love. Don't love even like Wayne Zimmer loves. Love as he loved you. That's a pretty big deal. When you get a big revelation of that, that means wowzers. Galatians 5, 6 says, For Christ Jesus, is in Christ neither circumcision nor uncircumcision. It's not about the rules. It's not about the law. It has nothing to do with that. When you're in Christ Jesus, when you're in his kingdom, the only thing that counts, the only thing that counts. What's the only thing that counts, Pastor? The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. That's it. Martin Luther said, the essence of the Christian faith is not knowledge, but love. You see, a lot of people, the Bible itself says knowledge puffs up. And there's a lot of people think Christianity is a pursuit of knowledge. We're a word people. I don't know about you, but I don't know too many pastors that use as much of the word as I do. We use a lot of word around here. It's a full-on fire hose Bible study coming at you full force. It's the word of the Lord. The essence of the Christian faith is not knowledge, but love. Love. What is love? Agape love. Agape love is sacrificially ascribing infinite worth to an other. See, that's what God did. How did he love you? God ascribed infinite worth to you. God ascribed so much love for you. He took his own son, his only begotten son, the son of God, God himself, and he gave him to lay his life down for you so that you could be brought into the family. I mean, that is self-sacrificing love, and that's the way we're supposed to love, and that's the culture of Impact Church is the self-sacrificing love where I ascribe way more value to you, worth to you. I will serve you. I don't matter who you are. I will place myself below you. I will compete with others to honor you more than anybody else because that's the culture. That's the rules around here is that we love each other unconditionally. <laughs> Well, I want the kingdom. I want all the revelation of the kingdom. Well, get it all. But if you get it and you don't have love, you got nothing. You can have power, wisdom, understanding. 1 Corinthians 13. You can have all of that stuff. But if you don't have love, if you don't have love, you got nothing. 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 First John 3, 23, and this is his commandment, that we should believe faith that expresses itself in love, that we should believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that we should love one another as he gave his commandment. His commandment is to love others as I have loved you. It's a new commandment. Have faith in him. Let his life invade your life, and that that very life, that faith that manifests the love of God in you and to you and through you, let it now be manifest in self-sacrificing, sacrificing, self-sacrificing love to others. You got orthodox the right belief and orthopraxy those two things believe right love right but often we've been more concerned with believing right than right action the church should be a place where the love of God is expressed I would way rather have poor doctrine than not have love it would way, way rather a place who doesn't know a whole lot about God, but they love one another. They know how much he's loved them. And because he's loved them so much, they just want to, I don't know a whole lot about this Jesus, but I know he touched my life. He saved me and set me free. And I want to love you like he's loved me. That's the kind of church I would rather have than a church that's full of head and all his glory to God. Let me, let me just recite Isaiah 42 right now to you. The glory of the God shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. I don't care if we don't really love one another. If we don't really ascribe infinite worth to others more than ourselves. If we don't stumble over ourselves to out honor other people more than you. We want a culture where people are impacted by. I watched how they did life and I was smitten by the love of God. 
First Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.3, dear brothers and sisters, we cannot help but thank God for you because of your faith that is flourishing and your love for one another that is growing. Man, that was the church Thessalonia. Just when he went there, Paul was there for two weeks, but the church exploded. It became a church of unbelievable impact. When he wrote back to them to celebrate the impact they had made, he celebrated their faith and their love for one another. That's a great church. That's a great church. That's the kingdom. Okay, we're going to read a passage of scripture. And then we're going to have communion. Is that all right? We're going to read this really quickly. But I want you to read this with me. And everywhere you see, uh, it's 1 John chapter 4, 7 to 21. And everywhere you see the word in yellow, I want you to say it out loud with me. Are you ready? Are you ready? This is participation for those of you who drifted off a little bit. Bring you back, right? You ready? Listen to this. Now, John, first John, John, it's a difficult book. And if you read that as a as a prescription of godly living, you'll beat the snot out of yourself. You really will, because it, it'll rip you, cut you. But you know, when you understand that John is writing that so that you would know who you are, not those so that you would be given a prescription for how to live the life of God, but he gave you a description for how the life of God works. Say prescription. Say description. It's not a prescription. It's not something to beat you over the head and say you could do better. It's something that was written to you so that you can know who you are and so that you could then manifest the revelation of who you are. And when you read it with the right lens, it's empowering to you. If you read it with the wrong lens, you can feel like a bag of snot. I don't even know what a bag of snot looks like, but anyways. All right. You ready? How many know the instructions? How many are ready? Yeah. All right. Beloved, let us love one another for is from God. And whoever has been born of God and knows God and anyone who does not, does not know God because God is in this the... Sorry about that. Let's start with in. In this the of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world that we might live through him. In this is not that we have God, but that he has us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so, we ought to also one another. No one has ever seen God. If we one another, God abides in us and his is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given in us his spirit and we have seen and testified that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world whosoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God God abides in him and he in God did you confess Jesus as Lord did you confess him as your Lord and Savior did you then he abides in you and him in God and so we have come to know we've come to know this we've come to know and to believe the that God has for us God is God. let's say that better come on God is God, woo, God is God. and whoever abides in God. abides in God and God abides in him by this is perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment has anybody got confidence in the day of judgment is anybody terrified in the day of judgment he's going to put a big screen up and show everybody all the evil stuff I did look ah! you know this is why I have confidence because he has rebirthed me I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus he's baptized me and poured his love in me and because of the working knowledge of that I have confidence in the day of judgment I have confidence in the day of judgment listen to this because as he is so also are we in this world there is no fear in but perfect cast out fear for fear has to do with punishment and whoever fears has not been perfected in God. we God. because he first God. us 
If anyone says I, if anyone says I, if anyone says I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not his brother whom he cannot, God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, this is the commandment we have from him. Whoever God must also his brother. See, the command isn't to love your brother like God loves. The command is that this is what believers do. This is the perfecting of the love of God in you, that you're going to find yourself, rather than taking offense, rather than getting upset, rather than, than, than not having incredible honor for others. Like, suddenly the lens is shifted, and everybody is beautiful. And I see no man after the flesh, but only after Christ. Suddenly the love of God working in your life. You cannot hate you cannot be offended you cannot do that because love has been perfected in you and this is the culture of kingdom and kingdom works best when the culture for kingdom is in manifestation now listen let's do this very quickly Chantel can you just go to the quote with mr. Swindle there All right. Marbles or grapes, which will it be? Every congregation has a choice. You can be a bag of marbles, independent, hard, loud, unmarked, and unaffected by others, or you can be a bag of grapes, fragrant, soft, blending, mingling, flowing into one another's lives. Marbles can be counted and kept. Grapes are made to be bruised and used. Marbles scar and clank, but grapes yield and cling. That's what a lot of churches are like. You get together on Sunday and wasn't that fun. Really glad that one came over to me and said, I just vomited all over me. Thank you very much for that. And then this one came, I love you, brother. Brah, but I just read <laughs> There's a big ugly one there, boom. See, let me, I'll give you a couple of things here. Marbles need an ex external structure. I just broke the external structure because I broke the structure, the marbles went everywhere. Because without some kind of control mechanism, without some kind of control, see, I go to that church because the pastor controls me, yells at me, shouts at me. If I don't show up, he's mean to me. And you see, when you're marbles, I mean, you're hard and you're, 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 you don't get along with each other. You bounce off each other. We're not looking for a bag of marbles. We're looking for a bag of grapes. And by the way, there's a lot of really good, really good price on grapes right now at Fresh Cope. Just thought I'd say. But you know, the interesting thing about grapes... Grapes have an internal structure. They're linked together. They're tied together. They don't need an external thing to hold them together because they're internally connected in line and, and aligned with each other. But you know, sometimes what church looks like, it looks like... Have you ever been to church and bounced off somebody? You know, in, in church, sometimes you can get bruised. Sometimes you can be affected. But you know, in Isaiah, it says, it says, the wine is in the cluster. The power is in the cluster. The power is in the gathering. The power is in it. You know, the, this, it's the bruising. It's the affecting. It's all those things. That's the beauty of community. And when the things get squeezed and the thing gets squashed, out runs the wine. And the wine is in the cluster. You know, sometimes you'll come to a church and here's what love looks like. You got really deeply hurt and offended, but you're hanging on. You're sticking through. You won't walk away from someone. You'll stay connected. You'll walk through forgiveness. You'll walk through love. You see, when people see how we love each other, what does love look like? It keeps no record of wrongs. It never fails. It always trusts. It always has affection. It'll always forgive. Always forgive. Always forgive. And you know something? The culture of the kingdom is love. 
in the culture of the kingdom is where you're going to meet and run into a crowd of people where we really intentionally and on purpose really care and really love each other. So we're not a bag of marbles. Amen. I didn't mean to break that, but it worked out okay. <laughs> I got a few around. I don't know. Sorry. I did that because I love the janitor. <laughs> you got your emblems? You got your emblems? The body of Christ. The body of Christ. See, every single sin, past, present, and future, was put in this body. This represents all your brokenness was put there. Come right now, bring everything you have. Bring your wretchedness to the table and say, thank you, Jesus. Bring all your brokenness, all that you are, all your failures, everything you're so fed up with, bring it right now to the table and say, Jesus. And you know what? Bring your sickness, bring your pains, and bring your hurts. Bring your broken heart, bring your broken body. By his stripes, you were healed. Expect right now. An unworthy manner, you know what the unworthy manner is? To do this without an expectation. He is here. And he's here to testify of his goodness in your life right now. The body of Christ. Let's eat together. water to wash that one down there. Oh, goes another marble. Just decided to move down the road to the first church of I can't stand people. <laughs> the blood of Jesus. It says in Acts 20 that the church was bought, was redeemed, was saved by the blood of God. We are drinking recognizing the blood of God. God's own divine blood poured over my brokenness, healed me in every single way, sanctified me and set me apart. God's own blood brought me life. And I now walk in the very life of God himself. And we thank you for your life. We thank you for the power that is in the blood of Jesus. We drink now expecting for a manifestation of your power. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Mm. Hallelujah. <laughs> there is a king, the king has a realm, and there are rules. And the rules are to love others as they've loved you. Amen. And you can do it because you've been perfected in love. You've been born in love. You have a bent towards love, whether you know it or not. It's already there. He's created it in you, and he's bringing it out of you. And so we want to see that over and over. And you know what? I'm not, I'm not chastising this church because it really does exist. I had Pastor Tim and Pam came last week from Toronto, and I came later on because I had to walk the dog. But they said, we walked in and experienced the culture of this church before you were here, and we just saw everything moving, people serving, people loving, people enjoying, people people laughing, people engaging, and they said, what a beautiful community. It's a beautiful community. It really is. And you know why it is? It's because we're intentional about love. We don't just do it when it feels like it. We're intentional about loving one another. Amen? And you know, you'll find you're able to do it more and more when you just drink deeply the fact of how much he loves you. So you know what? We love as we've been loved. Amen? Let me pray.